What's up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest number 214 at block height 624,418 on April 4th, uh, 2020. What's going on, everybody? Well, still the Twilight Zone, April 4th. All right. Yeah, still in the quarantine. Still, uh, I guess now it's a little bit, I'm looking out the window, people are wearing their masks now because uh, in the state of Colorado, it's now hip to be with a mask. But uh, I'm doing well. How are you doing, Janine? Oh, I, I didn't know it was hip to be with the mask. I thought it was hip to be with the scarf, because apparently the scarf is our lord and savior now. New shit <laughs> has come to light, man. Yeah, whatever you yeah, can throw over your I face. I have new information. I haven't been lying to you this entire time and have now changed my guidance because I've been caught. I'm going to give you more bad guidance instead. You know, you know maybe it's, instead of spending all this time, you know blaming me you just think you know maybe things are like a lot more complex than you know uh you know have you seen that study on how effective scarves are of course you haven't because there are none <laughs> <laughs> yeah it looks like they're gonna change their position on that guidance i mean uh across the board eventually but uh yeah it looks like it was all just to try and keep the supply crunch to the healthcare workers so that they can try and maintain those workers during this crisis but yeah they're starting to change their position yeah they should have just been honest with people in the first place um it helps but people need it more than you like is, is that really that hard to say i guess so really yeah but once again it's like this this new like it started with trump saying something about oh yeah everyone has a scarf you probably have a scarf use a scarf and then what was it, Mayor de Blasio and then the mayor of New, uh, no, Los Angeles, I think, that they're now saying, wear a scarf. And it's like, they're just giving this advice, no context whatsoever. They don't tell you that a scarf literally does nothing and, in fact, may do harm in terms of if you're trying to use it to protect yourself from the virus, it's like, it's basically useless. If you're trying to prevent yourself from coughing on others, sure, a scarf might help it 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 will prevent the large droplets from spewing forth in front of you and it'll go onto the scarf but it's not going to protect anyone from people who are coughing without a scarf so what what is this like can't <laughs> why is it so hard to just say we don't have enough masks masks are effective but we need them like stop giving people bad guidance it's going to get people killed yeah there, there's a study i read that literally looked at different types of like cloth and i think you know uh, cotton from a t-shirt if you have a pure cotton t-shirt it's actually like 70 percent effective like how hard is it you tell people what material is roughly how effective at filtering shit and they can try and use the best thing they have but like why lie to people like you lie to people and when they find out you lied to them they don't trust you anymore they don't trust the other things you say now well i think like we're saying it's all to really try to protect the market confidence like there was a worry about whether or not there was enough supply to go around and the healthcare workers are the ones so yeah instead of trying to be honest with people and spook the market and just make the whole situation serious from the get-go you know they try to play it half ass and half measures the whole way through mm -hmm. and you know um you know janine you showed us this uh in, in the, the chat before we started earlier today uh the the shipment of 3m masks from china that was intercepted i think in thailand and that that's not even the the first time i think it was uh was it switzerland also 
seized an order that was meant for France and Germany, if I'm remembering the places correctly. Like, we're yeah. starting to see countries seize supplies from each other now. Yeah, the story today was that the Berlin um, police had made an order for masks from Bangkok and uh, basically a Vietnam uh, War era something law was invoked and basically the U.S. seized that shipment of masks and diverted them to the U.S. And then the one from Switzerland, uh, which was, I think, many weeks ago um there was a shipment of masks going between germany and switzerland and they were stopped at the border uh and basically the german government said we need these masks we can't let you take them over the border to switzerland so yeah that that stuff is happening and that's not guess that's be following, good. is that the war defensive the war defense production act mm -hmm. yeah i mean Definitely, that's uh, not good. I mean, we were talking about this earlier in the mumble. There was a pretty raging discussion. I had to set the headphones down about, uh, you know, what's the deal? Because there are people that are, quote unquote, hoarding supplies. And, you know, these supplies are needed elsewhere. But like the uh, illegal way that they were just sort of seized and now uh, being distributed Seems to me like if you're printing six point something trillion dollars, you can afford to buy those out because your stupid mistakes didn't allow you to have it. It's not even just that. It's that like somebody's they're, property is their property. Like we can't just go property laws don't matter right now or we're just going to keep sliding down that slope. It's not going to stop with medical equipment that we need in this emergency. Well, it's not even that. It's that they're kind of concerned trolling because on the one hand, they're saying, oh, there's not enough masks. We need to seize them from people. And on the other hand, they're not allowing like there. I think there was a bunch of people trying to donate masks to nurses and those were getting blocked at the border. And it's just ridiculous. They're not approving new or they're not approving existing mask designs that um are not currently in use at hospitals like they're doing a bunch of bureaucratic blocking that it's it's a huge uh contributor to the fact that they have this shortage because they're they're trying to buy up specific types of masks that are you know already scarce because a lot of people have gone after them figuring that the government is lying to them and then there's other masks that are not being used because they're not approved for use in hospitals Mm -hmm. Like, I'm seeing reports of, like, nurses and medical professionals being fired or threatening with being fired just for talking about equipment shortages or refusing to, um, whatchamacallit, like, like, using equipment that isn't officially allowed or whatever the fuck in the hospital. And that's just fucking insane. Like, that is crazy. All right. Well, yeah, I mean, we got to... Think of like the governors are doing different methods on how to handle this situation. So are hospital administrators. And, uh, you know, I'm, I've got my sisters. They're working at a hospital in uh, the Fort Worth area. And uh, luckily it's not that bad over there. But their staff, they seem to be taking in these uh, non-approved masks and uh, using them where they can. I imagine, you know, if uh, they get in a real crunch like New York City or one of these other areas that there's bad breakouts like New Orleans, then, you know, that could change really quickly. But, um, yeah, this is where I was talking to her last night about it. And she's like, it's just really boring. And I was like, I was thinking about how, you know, being on the front line is boring. You know, there's a lot of this, like, uh, this effort to try and just be ready. And then, uh, and then there's a lot of just waiting. It's like the hurry up and wait attitude. And uh, yeah, so there's a lot of these different hospitals that are taking different approaches. And yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's like, you know, governors need to sort their shit out on that line. Like that needs to be explicitly allowed right now. And I think that they need to go far enough to the point that states need to start passing laws that go if the federal government try to take away your medical license for retarded shit like this during this, then the state should just ignore that. And they should still be considered a valid medical practitioner in that state, regardless of what the federal government says.
Well, this is definitely just where we stand right now. It's <laughs> it's hard to say how they're going to play this out. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I guess last thing on the Corona uh, topic before we move into stuff. Um, so I've seen two things that have me worried now uh, in the last day or so. Um, Singapore is about to go on a 30 day lockdown right now after somewhat keeping this contained just by doing, um, you know, trace surveillance and tracking down chains of infection. And Tokyo right now, I'm starting to see a lot of stories um, that the government in Tokyo is worried that an outbreak is starting to take hold there. And the social distancing measures they've done without a full shutdown aren't going to be enough to stop that. So there's two areas now where it, things looked very good based on the data, and they're starting to take the, the same measures that, that people are in, in areas that have locked down. And I think even South Korea is stepping up their, their control measures because things are still spreading. Yeah, I've been seeing that lockdown on international traffic, and it's one of the things where, you know, as bad as New York City is, like those airports are still open and uh, things are still moving through there. And like we've said, like there's been this gradual different approaches, different measures, but they're all sort of going in the same direction. And um, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if, yeah, the, this thing just keeps getting clamped down. I mean, I just hope that we're going to start to see a little bit more of a... Well, I just lists of the nonsense, like of the seizing of property and like, you know, trying to get paddle boaters off of the ocean. Like that was the stupidest thing I'd seen. Yeah, that was crazy. You're yeah. social distancing yourself too much, sir. You need to be arrested. Yeah, it's fucking insane. But, you know, I guess, uh, I don't know, do, do you mean you got anything else that's been going on in that front you wanted to touch on before we move into things? Um, I mean, not really. Just... Your government's lying to you, <laughs> and it doesn't surprise me. That's it. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I guess let's slide along into some more optimistic-looking things. Um, yeah. So five days ago, on March thirtieth, um, roast beef dropped a blog post on LSAT, um, Lightning Service Authentication Tokens. Um, a draft for a spec proposal um, to deal with payments and specifically the 402 payment required status code in HTTP uh, to <clears throat> build out monetized uh, APIs. And this is a really awesome thing. Um, it's also coming with um, Aperture, <clears throat> their implementation of a proxy server that can sit between any type of API, excuse me, um, but sit between any API and the internet and kind of add this, you know, micropayment uh, 402 functionality to it. And pretty much the idea is that they're, they're taking the macaroons, which are kind of an iteration on how to handle authentication cookies and things like that. Um, that I actually think uh, Google put out, but it's, it's a really cool data structure with a lot of features. And it's, it's pretty much a cookie that has an integrity check as well as a cryptographic signature tying it to a root certificate or key. So you have the authority issuing the individual cookie that can be cryptographically validated on the user side. And it also explicitly spells out what exact permissions um, the owner of that cookie has in regards to a service or an API. So, you know, Rick could have a cookie that says he can watch unlimited hours of Netflix all month. I could have one that says you can watch four hours of Netflix per month. And, you know, Janine could just not have one of these cookies. And one of the really cool things about this is I can actually take my cookie with four hours of Netflix time and I can make a new one to give to Janine that says Janine's allowed to use two hours of my time. And the system will be able to see that my cookie is valid 
my cookie like signed off on the the cookie that I gave Janine or the macaroon and that there's a delegation there of some of my authorities that's legitimate and so it's 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 just a way more versatile kind of replacement for a cookie sorry and um and that's how the cookie crumbles (laughs) (laughs) sorry my finger slipped on the other button but um you know and this is something that's been used in um lnd just as how you interact with um the, the the lightning node and so now this is pretty much just a generalized feature um that you can bake into an api and it's simultaneously something you can use um like let's say i just want to stream this video i could um you know set up a connection get an invoice from the video streaming service um pay for these macaroons and then those macaroons are my authentication like that's that's my credits with the streaming service or whatever and you can generalize that to logins for different types of things, um, you know, replacements for um, captures and bot prevention filters like that. But this is just a really general authentication mechanism online um, that allows you to pay for services or just use as a general authentication mechanism um, in a much more private way. Like, you know, think about all the, the different types of services like Netflix or a Twitter account. Or, well, not a Twitter account. You need a name for that. But, you know, something like 4chan where there isn't usernames. Like this can be just a general way to access and handle um, access controls for services on the Internet that is a lot more private and secure and just a lot more functional in what you can do with it. And so this is a really fucking cool thing. And, you know, I want to see what people start doing with the Aperture implementation that they dropped with it. I want cookies. <laughs> right? I know. I'm feeling the craving for some cookies with some secret authentication to get into some secret part of the internet. It sounds awesome. The best part is I actually have cookies. Suck it. I... <laughs> cookies Damn. are for the plebes, sheep, steak. Well, I'll just stick with some steak and dark chocolate. No cookies. But I'd like some of these cookies, though. Really, I like this. This is an interesting development. Yeah, I mean, like, think about that. Like, you know, I could just have some credit with a service like Netflix. And just the whole way this works, I could just give you some of that. And it's it's it works out properly. What is that? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, my God kitty i thought that was a baby shrieking but like you know what i mean it's like i can like right now like you know i mean people share their netflix passwords and shit like everybody knows it um but you know like we this is an access control mechanism that supports something like that without arguably stealing from somebody you know what i mean like one person is paying for a netflix account and five people are using it um even though they're not paying for it like this type of authentication mechanism is the one person could pay for it and i could just like here's permission to watch one movie under my account air quote or whatever and the service is designed to work like that like it's not just he 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 we're being slick you know what i mean yeah, I mean, that's like you're actually creating out an economy for these services in a way that's efficient for the market. And Right, kitty? <laughs> Don't you agree? Give that kitty cat a, ca- a cookie or a biscuit or something. <laughs> yeah, this is going to be really cool. Um, I think uh, next up, we, we got a whole little chunk of different lightning stuff in the first yeah, part Yeah, there's here, been a lot but, uh... of lightning going on. Think Janine's up with uh, the next cool thing going on? Yeah, so uh, originally, if you had uh, heard, um, the Lightning Hackathon was supposed to be in Barcelona. Obviously, that couldn't happen because no one can cross borders, or very few people can cross borders right now. So, uh, for a while, it looked like it was actually going to happen on Second Life, and then they were like, well, Second Life doesn't really work too well for a hackathon type event because it's more hands-on 
And so it ended up being much more simplified. Um, so basically, we're just talking to each other on Mattermost and Jitsi. And yeah, so I don't know what I what I didn't have time to check out the other sessions and talks that happened today, but the one that I was involved with, um, lots of things happened today, and tomorrow is the wrap up day, I believe, and it goes until 8 p.m. So if you still want to see that, just check out the Fulmo Twitter account because they'll be sharing the wiki that has the schedule and the Jitsi links and. Uh, joining the matter most if you want to be talking to people is that a space cat you got with you uh she's not she's not next to me right now but she will be very soon because she really wants more food all right she really wants her cookies what <laughs> are the autistic nerds going to build in quarantine this week tune in next time to find out well, you you may be interested to find out. Uh, well, most people did not break quarantine for this hackathon, but someone did. <laughs> oh, as long as they're not being an idiot about it, um, I'm not going to fucking yell about that. No, nope, no one's being idiots. Just a lot of people who, uh, like, most of these people have been isolating for basically the last month, myself included. So... Haven't haven't had too much human interaction outside of the people living in our households. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like people need to be smart and safe about this. But yeah, like don't look at this like any kind of interaction with anyone is verboten now. Like that's that's insane. Yeah, I mean, this has uh, been planned for a while. I know that uh, like Nadava, we had a. Uh a VR get together last night or a VR deep dive in last night. And, um, yeah, so he could get to this event today and, uh, and this weekend, I know that they were doing some hacking and, uh, some pretty interesting plans. I'm, I'm excited to see what they put together. Oh, and I should clarify because uh, a lot of people are mixing the words quarantine and isolation and they are separate things because if you're quarantining, that means you're suspected, or confirmed to have the virus, whereas if you're just isolating, that means you're it's a preventative measure to prevent you from being exposed to that risk. So if someone did not break quarantine, they broke isolation. <laughs> yeah, seclusion. Boop, 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 boop. But yeah, a lot of people, uh, well, we have a lot of free time on our hands now, so you can literally spend the entire day uh, talking to people about how to put some lightning stuff together. We're fighting Russians in a gas cloud. Or just trying to figure out VR. I, that UX needs to... I mean, you know, they're going to improve all these meeting platforms, but yeah, VR's got some ways to go. Okay, Zoomer. <laughs> <laughs> you're right, right, though. I mean, you're right. I've been doing the Zoom calls and stuff. I mean, like, the Mozilla Hubs one, I'm going to say that. Like, that's the only one I've actually used. I mean... It's it works when it's just a couple of people, but the minute you put more than a couple of people in there, it gets really glitchy. And uh, I can't do the um, I don't I need to check out the Altspace VR and these things that you can do a desktop app for because I just don't I'm not going to do the headset stuff. I can't do it. The seizures not won't allow it. And, and Zoom, dude, like fuck Zoom. Like I I am not even using that anymore. Like I, ever since I first used it for something, um, the, uh, what was it? The, the special edition, um, that I did myself with, uh, the guys, uh, from commerce block, uh, Tom and, um, uh, Greg, um, when I was muting myself, like when I wasn't talking because I was just trying to, to limit the amount of, of nonsense I would have to edit out, um, when I put that together, um, it picked when, when I muted my microphone in the application, it continued recording and putting everything my mic was picking up in the audio track anyway. And so from that point on, I started only using it on a junk laptop that I have just for stuff like that. I'm not even doing that anymore with it. We'll, 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 we'll get into all that shit when, uh, when well, we get to that story in a bit, but yeah, it sucks. But it's yeah. like the network effect thing right now. It's like the it's like the new Facebook thing, except it's like 
worse because people are doing like legit government meetings and stuff on this. Yeah, you know, I, I think I'm going to yeah. just hop oh, into the, the next one and we, we can go nuts on this when we, we get to that story, Janine. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, there's, look, there's yeah, luckily. Be a lot. <laughs> well, luckily, if you want to participate in the hackathon, uh, there's no Zoom, it's Jitsi, and there's no Slack, it's Mattermost. Mm-hmm. Yeah, keeping with the lightning chunk uh, we're going to jump along to another awesome thing that lightning labs dropped two days ago um so they have released a new tool now called faraday uh pretty much with the idea of helping individual node operators manage their liquidity and individual channels properly um so this is pretty much something that looks at a few different heuristics um, regarding peers on the network and activity within channels and makes recommendations about how to manage those. So like it'll look at, let's say you have three channels open. It'll look at the amount of value being routed through different channels and compare them relatively. And so like, uh, the example they have in the blog post, they have one that did 300, um, 205, I'm assuming sats in value, and then one that did 32. Um, they recommend closing the channel that only did 32 sats of volume because compared to the other ones, it's only a tiny fraction. And so that channel isn't performing as well in terms of fee revenue versus the other ones you have open. And so that will recommend, you know, close that channel and find a a better um, peer to open a channel with. Um, There's also some functionality that looks at how often certain channels attempt to route payments to you and fail um, because of different, um, you know, states of balances inside that channel and which side they're on because that information isn't publicly broadcast. Um, You can only kind of deduce that when a direct peer of yours just keeps failing at at actually routing payments that they're trying to route through you. Um, They also have something that looks at peer uptimes, although this will, um, like there's no persistent data here. So if your LND instance goes down, Um, all the uptime counters get reset. So there's a feature in this function that will not um, make recommendations until after the node has been up and gathering data for at least four weeks by default. Although you can configure that yourself uh, with the idea that, you know, if you've been up for an hour and all your nodes have 100% uptime, that's not really a you know, a good view into the reliability long term. Um, There's also some recommendations um, based on uh, fees and the different fee policies that uh, different peers set for channels they have with you. And as well, um, they look at um, kind of the the difference between just closing channels out and um, kind of closing them out to reopen the, the same channel with a different liquidity balance. And so it's, it's kind of a tool to really give node operators a, a good idea on how to maximize their returns until that type of analysis and heuristic application can be done in an automated way, which is something that's going to kind of be a ways away. But, you know, this is... Yeah, it's a, I've I've kind of shat on Lightning Labs a little bit, uh, you know, over the last year or so compared to other teams just looking at, you know, concrete direction and stuff that's actually coming out of the company. But, you know, that stuff's really been picking up pace in the last few months. And so I'm kind of excited to see what happens when they really get in their stride and kind of keep this pace going. Yeah, I think I'm with you on that and maybe few others is just like uh, to see some you know some good stuff developments coming out of lightning labs that's that's good i mean uh it's definitely been something that i know a lot of people have been wondering like where's the you know and what's the it's like all right well here's some stuff let's uh let's put it out there and start tinkering with it and see what we could do i mean because definitely sounds like there's some good optimizing tools here to try and like uh, max like you were saying as your return it's just the the whole idea of 
the incentive to keep a routing node running like you need a financial incentive there because how many people are going to keep doing that in the long run when there's nothing in it for them you know what i mean yeah i mean that was one of the things whenever looking at the lightning network and like why would you run a node and it's like oh well i mean you can on this network i mean it's not just about you know the verification of the outputs this is like you could actually, you know, start charging for routing and you could optimize that to like you could route the most transactions and get efficient at it and start actually making some Satoshis on the network. Mm-hmm. But, so. uh, whoa. All right. I'm still here. Um, yeah, I think that's you up with the, the last, uh, bit of light. Yeah. yeah. I mean, talking about, you know, stacking some sats and uh, everything going on in the Lightning Network. Like, let's talk a little bit more development. So there's been a lot going on with uh, Jack Maller's new uh, Strike Payments app over the past few weeks. And I just wanted to update everyone. And uh, it's mainly two big updates. First, the Strike Payments app is being used here in Boulder, Colorado for medicinal cannabis curbside pickup. The whole process keeps individuals in their vehicle with their windows rolled up, allows for the payment of uh, to go through the window, you know, they, you just keep the window up and you can scan the QR code through there at a distance and uh, they leave the product out there and then, you know, the patient can come out there and get it without risking anyone. It's a really good protocol as uh, a good amount of these medical patients have immune deficiencies. And last week I knew about this implementation being set up here locally and it, yeah, like I say, and it works really well. I mean, any, uh, like any new best practice, there are some pain points that we still got to work out, but those uh, those kinks will get worked out over the coming weeks and months. And I mean, we got to keep this uh, economy going somehow and patients still need their product. And, and I don't know, handling cash seems like a pretty big risk right now. And uh, OK, so on to the second update announced earlier this week with the uh, new strike.me feature. It allows any Strike user to take their username and create a strike.me slash your username Lightning tipping wallet. We've seen different tipping platforms on Lightning take off, and I think it's a really good idea. I mean, if you read the blog post by Jack, you can read his reasoning behind enabling this feature. There are traditional platforms for sending frictionless payments. However, you're dealing with compatibility issues, you know, like I've got Venmo, well, I've got Cash App, well, now we can't send each other money. You got high fees on some of these platforms and uh, potential for censorship like we've seen all over PayPal. And with the Lightning Network, anyone can send some sats with their different Lightning wallets. As those LN, as those Lightning Network barriers uh, to entry keep dropping, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see more and more of this use case being adopted. The amount of uh, bloggers, Twitter warriors, uh, gamers, content creators of all forms can now have a one-off or streaming revenue of Satoshis. That's a major benefit of these LN tipping systems. It operates on top of the Bitcoin network where there are already millions of users. So I know uh, some people will say, now, where are you going to spend those LN tips? Well, anywhere, since those tips are going to be transferred to fiat instantly, settled in your bank account. <laughs> That's right. So uh, here's this quote from the statement, uh, from Jack's statement, uh, blog post on this strike.me, quote, Currently, strike usage has been explosive. In the last 20 days, we've seen $20,000 worth of payment on strike with $3,000 worth of payments made in a single day earlier this week. With our existing group of small private beta users alone, strike is already on pace to achieve $250,000 to $500,000 worth of volume in a calendar year. I'll be moving strike out of beta sooner than you think with many more strike features and products coming out over the coming months, close quote. So everyone stay tuned to uh, Jack Mallers and the team at Ellen Strike and, of course, Ellen Zap. And, uh, yeah, great work all around from all those guys. And, uh, yeah, if you want to strike me, I'm strike.me slash crypto Rick. So uh, pretty awesome. You can send me some sats. Yeah, man, dude, Jack just keeps knocking it the fuck out of the park. <laughs> I mean, like... The strike really just has some crazy potential, like looking all of it at, at all of this. I mean, like right now, the, the base function is I can just hook a debit card and make that speak Bitcoin to pay people in Bitcoin. That can go the other way, and people can just send Bitcoin to my bank account and turn up as fiat. 
and you know talking like just what you were saying earlier about like different payment app issues and shit i mean like what why isn't there any reason that jack could try and and get through the regulatory hurdles to plug into shit like paypal and cash app and venmo and be a translation bridge between those things as well like you know what i mean Whoa. like it can just become a adapter to plug all of these different fragmented legacy things together using bitcoin yeah that's a that's like a really i mean i'm sure they're you know, talking to different people, like, because, yeah, there's definitely some interoperability problems with all those different platforms. And with Lightning and Bitcoin, you can just seamlessly connect them if you plug in, like, the Strike app in the back end. Like, yeah, that's a pretty interesting uh, efficiency gain there across the board. Dude, I would be shocked if Jack isn't already looking at that shit. Because last time I fucking brought up an idea when we had him to talk, uh, or had him to talk about, um, wild brain um just the zap wallet and i brought up the idea of this it's like okay and then bam strike comes out it's like okay you yeah. were already doing that <laughs> yeah man i could tell you this guy is like uh moves ahead of the chessboard like he's a really smart chess player and he's a really uh you know just a smart smart person and uh knows how to play his cards right and i mean yeah i wouldn't be surprised if there's some interesting discussions going on behind the scenes definitely gonna be a big mover in the space this whole strike payments yep all right janine so something completely shocking happened why don't you tell us the the totally unexpected development going on with all of our information floating around out there. Yeah, you know, I know I know this may be hard to hear, but um Facebook is sharing your data with people without your consent or knowledge. It's amazing, <gasps> isn't it? You don't see. Yeah, so there's an article in Reuters um that says that the COVID-19 Mobility Data Network a group of 40 health researchers from universities, including Harvard, Princeton, and Johns Hopkins, said that um, since mid-March, its members have been sharing insights gleaned from the social media giant's uh, data with California, Massachusetts, and New York City. Using mobile location data in the coronavirus fight comes uh, amid intense scrutiny of the privacy practices of tech companies, which collected... Uh, detailed information about people's interests on apps and websites often to target ads. Facebook and the researchers leading the project say that they have overcome those concerns by aggregating the data several several times over and funneling it through academics. Now that is an interesting sentence. They have overcome the concerns of security and privacy by aggregating the data several times over and funneling it through academics. I see, I see the clear connection there. <laughs> um, the researchers share broad findings with state and local health departments which do not receive any raw data. Oh goody, because we know that that also works. Um, Facebook confirmed it was sharing the data as part of its nearly year-old disease prevention MAPS program, which has also aided efforts to increase vaccination rates in Malawi and track cholera outbreaks in Mozambique. Uh, Chief Executive Mark Zuckerberg, uh, Mr. Sugar Mountain, told reporters last month that he would not consider sharing Facebook's data directly with governments. Oh, he would not consider. Okay, because I was under the impression that, you know, that was already happening. So he doesn't have to consider anything. Uh, Mr. Sugar Mountain is uh, safe and secure in the existing, <laughs> existing relationships in that regard uh, with governments. Um, including the uh, company of the next story as well. You can't be 20 on Sugar Mountain. All right, I missed the joke on Sugar Mountain. Okay, so Zuckerberg in German translates to Sugar Mountain. Oh, okay. Now, now I'm right on. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, big shock, right? Oh my god, the company that collects all of our personal private information is sharing that with governments to surveil us for all of this. Wow! Also, yeah, every time you open the news Facebook, 
you're sharing a ton of information about where you are, what device you have, how you're using the device, blah, blah, blah. When you use websites that have the Facebook uh, share this button, whatever it's called, uh, in the page, uh, that's also a way for Facebook to collect information about you, even if you don't have a Facebook account. Facebook literally creates accounts for people that don't have Facebook accounts. Well, they, they create profiles of people who don't have Facebook accounts and aggregate information about you so that if you were to ever get an account, they already have information about you and can, you know, further surveil you from that direction. But yeah, I don't know why people are surprised about this. I feel like attempts to get any expectation of privacy from Facebook are pretty much fruitless at this point. People have been trying for years. It doesn't work. They've even tried to host Facebook on an Onion service, which is kind of hilarious. Um, yeah, I don't know why we're surprised. It's kind of like the phone story from uh, the last episode where I said, you know, the fact that they're able to tell when you're standing next to another person that you probably shouldn't be standing next to is because they already had those tracking capabilities and vulnerabilities built into the phone before any of this happened. They were always able to do it. Now they're just being honest about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, this is something that's been going on with uh, Google, too. I mean, I, it hasn't, uh, there hasn't been something pushed out yet about it. I think everybody just understands that Google tracks, tracks all your metadata and anybody that's been walking around with the phone. I think Google's is much more like you can type in that your area of the country and it'll tell you how much percentage social distancing is going on in your area based off of your data. And yeah, I mean, like this is a weird time with uh, surveillance and um, and that development process like uh those that are trying to uh, help develop this tracking technology like i can understand they're thinking like this is necessary for this situation i've seen a little bit more like some better efforts with like maybe like uh people that like work in hospital zones they're like putting on these specific devices that is like it's meant for tracking you because you're like one of these workers that's around somebody all the time so therefore, like if you're wearing one of these devices, then you're somehow, you know, like uh, I guess in the data point, it'll be like you're more likely to spread. But it's still uh, it's still going to be creating this two tiered movement system that's dangerous and a huge slippery slope. It's just it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm still I, I have no idea what this phrase aggregating the data several times over means, because literally aggregating just means you you put the you you know gather the data so what does it mean to aggregate it several times over does anyone well, know well clearly, does anyone Julie, know can, if can someone add, translate the buzzword if we add a record <laughs> of your phone being in your house to another record of your phone being in your house they cancel each other out and they can't see where you are duh oh that's great i wish i would have thought of that <sighs> Yeah, and this is this is going to get a lot worse too cuz it's not just Facebook uh gearing up for the these kinds of platforms and programs. No, this is like it's just like the remote meetings and the VR right now. This is another one of these fields that is just blowing up because of the situation. You know what, Janine, um the the next story up, uh I'm going to move the Zoom stuff up um to after that so we can just touch on that all in one go. All right. Well, so the next story, uh, it's basically another company that we all love to hate, or at least I do, and that's Palantir. Um, yes, they unironically uh, <laughs> named a, a surveillance technology company that cooperates with governments and violates human rights in many cases, uh, Palantir, after the uh, spy device in Lord of the Rings used by the evil people. <laughs> oh my god. Um, you know, I mean, it's just a great name. Like, okay, I gotta, I gotta like... jump in real quick with a little nuance as a Tolkien nerd here. Um, it, it was it was more like know, the evil people to be, gave it yes. to the men as like a way to slowly like trick and poison them and subvert them and they fell for it. Yeah, and actually the planteers in themselves were not 
meant to be evil devices. They were just ways for the different, I can't remember if it's different races or just, you know, different groups to communicate with each other. But then the evil people turned it into a surveillance device on their enemies, blah, blah, blah. And then you you get Saruman and all. Anyway, great, great name for a company. Um, Anyway, yeah, so Palantir is... um, they're they're not like Facebook. They're not pretending to not be working with governments. They are actively looking for partnerships with well, they're they're just being quiet about it, but they are actively um it seems seeking to get some relationships with governments in order to quote battle the spread of COVID-19 and make strained healthcare systems more efficient. Uh, the software company is in discussions with authorities in France, Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, uh, according to a person who did not want to be identified because the negotiations are private. It already has a deal with the National Health Service in the UK or the NHS. Um, and yeah, so they claim that they're going to, quote, help trace and analyze the spread of the virus. Um, help hospitals predict staff and supply shortages, find bottlenecks in the medical supply chain, and tell prospective customers, uh, or they're telling prospective customers that it can help them plan to exit quarantine measures, which is, uh, yeah, (laughs) that'll be fun. Yay, one of the fucking private spinoffs from the cia in that group is getting involved hooray don't we all feel safe and protected now yeah so in case i mean for people who are familiar with what palantir does um it it's not too hard to imagine what kind of deal they would have and what they would do but Uh, According to Bloomberg, uh, they say when a nation or company buys access to Palantir, it can use the data analytics software to to pull far-flung digital information into a single repository and mine it for patterns. Oh, look at all those buzzwords. In the U.S., Palantir has a long-term contract with the Center for Disease Control and, you know, the CIA as well. That's fun. Oh, and ICE, that too. Um, And is working with the agency to combat the virus's spread in the U.S., uh yeah um still the company has run into controversy about how its data mining capabilities have been used in the past such as enabling immigration deportation policies championed by president trump fun Mm -hmm. pretty much a private uh spy company that the u.s government loves to go pay i know if I was Run, to make a long chain of I... assumptions, this is probably going to be them involved in actively gathering the data, which probably means ways to compromise devices and get information when the voluntary source is unwilling to do so. Yeah, and I haven't checked recently, but as far as I can remember, uh, the company has been headed by Peter Thiel, which is hilarious because Peter Thiel still pretends to be a libertarian who cares about civil liberties. And yeah, no, those those these things don't go together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking about how crazy it is that this is going on. And at the same time, it's like we're thinking about our rights and, you know, just the level of infringement that's going on right now and yeah it's like at a certain point i'm not saying like stand up and like you know but i mean like uh we do need an an, another uh we need a technological technologically sound innovative way to work our way out of this problem and um there's people working on it we need to get moving Mm -hmm. all right And then this is going to be fun. Uh, Zoom and the fucking buffet of shit. Yeah, so if you're in the education space or your company just did... That is is the sound of... Ten points, Kitty. (laughs) That is ten points. That was definitely ten points. That was books off of a bookshelf. That is very high up above the television. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, 10 points for Kitty, who's going to have to wait even longer for her dinner. Um, anyway, so 
in the realm of privacy violating technology, uh, a lot of you have probably been using Zoom lately if your company has had to scramble to figure out a way of how to communicate over long distances. Um, weirdly enough, uh, at least in my experience, a lot of schools uh, have already moved to doing everything almost digitally, and yet for some reason it's completely stumped them uh, now that they actually have to rely on that stuff to actually get anything done. Um, but anyway, so Zoom. Yeah, a lot of people are using it. I've, as Shinobi mentioned earlier with his experience, I've never liked it. I thought it was poorly made, and I assumed from the start that it wouldn't have good privacy built in, and of course, it was worse than I thought. Uh, basically, a former uh, NSA hacker and security researcher um, has found two previously undisclosed flaws in Zoom, uh, and there's been a lot of these recently, so these probably are not the only two, but uh, according to Wardle, the two bugs can be launched by a local attacker. That's where someone has physical control of a vulnerable computer. Once exploited, the attacker can gain and maintain persistent access to the innards of a victim's computer, allowing them to install well malware or spyware. Um, they, uh, they claim that Zoom uses a shady technique, one that is also used by Mac malware to install the Mac app without user interaction. Uh, Wordle found that a local attacker with low-level user privileges can inject the Zoom installer with malicious code to obtain the highest level of user privileges known as root. Um, yeah, so Zoom is bad. Um, some people have suggested that uh, you can you can mitigate this by um, just running the app in the browser and not actually installing it, which the very few times that I have had to use Zoom, that's what I've done. I've used it in the browser. I am not installing that shit. But regardless, I probably, I'm going to also assume that the browser application has flaws too, that it's not going to protect your privacy that much better, but you know, I, at least you're not installing it and it's just running in your browser. But, um, uh, I, I don't know if it actually has the same, there's another thing where when you're running the app, the uh, Zoom application can actually see uh, what other functions you're doing, I think, in the browser. I don't know if it can see other applications that you're running on the device, I think that was also a thing. But yeah, again, I don't know if running it just in the browser, not installing it, helps that. Um, it's just, this stuff was not designed for privacy, it was designed for enterprise, it was, it, and they probably didn't uh, think any of this through, they didn't think about how children would be using this to talk to their teachers, they didn't think that sensitive business meetings would be happening, um, so it doesn't surprise me that they didn't care about privacy to begin with, but they definitely have a lot of features that seem to be kind of deliberately malicious, uh, as a lot of, you know, quote, free applications are, uh, that they, a lot of their business, or at least a portion of their business is based on them surveilling what you do so that they can run analytics and then sell that off to marketing companies, blah, blah, blah. I, I think it's, it's a lot more uh, deliberate than that. Um, if, if you didn't see, uh, this one floating around, uh, a fucking, what was it? The C citizen lab. Um, it's a research group from the uh, uh, yeah. university of Toronto. They found that like, not only are they only using 128 bit keys, despite the documentation saying they're using 256 bit, they're using AES in a way that does not hide um, patterns in encrypted data that could allow, you know, shrinking the entropy range for an attack. But they also don't actually end to end encrypt anything. They just encrypt the connections between your client and their server. And some of the tests this group ran um, showed that they were actually sending the session keys used to encrypt that to a server in Beijing, China. And that Zoom, despite being a U.S. company, actually owns three Chinese subsidiaries 
who develop all the software for Zoom. Yep. So yeah, like, as it. far as I'm concerned, Zoom is literally a Chinese intelligence operation or intelligence well, operation. Like that that's what's going on. You know, it's like uh well this I mean, maybe. I mean, uh, you know, it's also uh, what governments are using right now to uh, to host like council meetings and things like that, too. Like, I mean, this is mm -hmm. not just and this is where it's like you're saying. I mean, there's a lot of really important data right there that needs to be encrypted. And I know everybody's like, well, what about Jitsi? Jitsi's open source. And I'm even thinking about like saying, yeah, we're going to move, make the move to Jitsi on my meetup. Like no more Zoom meetups. We're going to be doing Jitsi meetups just because of the very obvious flaws that have been pointed out but i'm still very highly suspect of jitsi i mean like uh you know we got somebody here in the mumble that just posted something you can look how they're pulling analytics from google in jitsi i don't know what they're using it for and i mean jitsi just works really well it works very well it's highly optimized and that sort of tech says that there's like a big a bigger team behind that i mean i'd like to get some uh i don't mean some people that are really know their shit together and like really test the end-to-end -end encryption aspect of Jitsi because like uh, like you're saying I mean there's lots of things to worry about right now and you know this is a time like user activated software where like people that understand this tech and understand how to use it we need to get together and make sure that this stuff is actually operating the way it says it is mm -hmm. well yeah I mean uh, so the the link that was posted about Jitsi connecting to Google Analytics is that for the service that they run where they host the call or is that the actual application like if you were to set up your own jitsi server is that part of the code i'm sure I think that if this you... looks like the the client yeah yeah okay but yeah that 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 could just be simple use stuff for troubleshooting like i don't know probably get roasted for saying this but google analytics um is not necessarily always a uh, a big privacy concern on an individual level depending on how it's utilized yeah either way i mean like the fact is jitsi is a very i mean to me i've used it a few times it's seamless it works really well and i'm like how come everybody's not using this i mean we should be and i mean like i'd like to give that recommendation if we had a little bit more testing on the end-to-end -end encryption aspect of it mm -hmm. i mean i don't disagree there at all like this now more than ever is the time to vet all of this shit like everything is being done remotely right now which means everybody's shit is at potential risk of being compromised and like you said i mean and like we're saying i mean there's lots of important meetings going on here and uh you know when it comes to the ability to surveil on people's activities i mean now that everybody's doing everything through these devices i mean we were doing everything anyway but i mean there's a lot of in-person inter interaction that you can still you know, you have a certain level of privacy as long as you leave your phones out of the room and you can, you know, go for a walk and you don't have to worry about this stuff. But now it's like, no, you got to be inside. Everybody's communicating through these things. It's like all the data is coming through there. And it just seems like that could be used so much more. Uh, so a lot more of a powerful weapon when it's like all the data is all the, the information is going through there. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. And this is uh, let's let's jump into the next one. So um. <laughs> This is a pretty interesting idea. Um, Huawei um, is trying to push for an extension to TCP IP um, with the ITU, um, an international organization for setting standards. It's the International Telecommunications Union um, on different communication protocols. Um, and they've pretty much started pushing for this very vaguely defined um, proposal called new IP, which I, I personally have not been able to find any thorough specification proposals or anything yet. Just a slide deck going, we, we need to do this because of the internet of things and, and self-driving cars and blah, blah, blah. But the, the slide deck and some of the proposals kind of vaguely being made really bother me. Um, and, and first I want to go into kind of a legitimate issue here. 
that on face is what is being addressed. And that is like the, the internet of things it, I think is idiotic, but it, it's happening. Like the, there is a massive proliferation of the amount of devices put on the internet and little things like that are going to be way more numerous than everybody's main computing devices, like their phones or their, their desktops or laptops. And this is a real scalability issue with the internet itself. Every one of those things is something that could be compromised and send malicious traffic or be put to malicious uses on the internet as a whole. And the simplest way this is quickly becoming a problem is all of those IoT devices out there can be hijacked and used in a botnet for DDoS attacks. So the, the more of these little stupid devices plugged in everywhere, the more ammunition there are for hackers to DDoS things like Facebook or Google or big important government services, like big centralized things on the internet. And that's a problem. Now, personally, I think the solution to that is to have less big centralized services and distribute them more. Balance that out. If there's more things to use as ammo, then make more things that they have to pick to attack. But a lot of the, the general attitude towards how to address that is pretty much baking in on some level or another um, access controls and restrictions and the ability to filter things on the internet so that different routers or, or network operators could effectively identify malicious traffic from hijacked or, or compromised devices like this and just just turn it off stop passing those packets and that necessitates being able to tell who is is who like where in the network is that specific device connected because you need to be able to track and figure out where to filter and stop passing those packets to go network, ignore this device. And this is the kind of vague feature and rationale that Huawei is making and pushing for this new IP proposal. And I think like, j just look at the AG crypto story um, that, that we talked about a month or two back and, and just how thoroughly backdoored and compromised cryptographic machines were because people realized what was going on, realized the, the downsides and the upsides and took advantage of that. And that played out for decades in the technology that we all use, like now more than ever, even though, like I said, there, there is some sound reasoning on some level behind where this, this proposal is going. We need to be skeptical as shit about foundational changes to things like this. Because just look at, look at how not paying attention played out over the last 30, 40 years. Like that can't happen again. The, like, it, the, like we should be a hundred times as skeptical of things like this as we are of proposed changes to Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. oh, hold on. Be because like those proposed changes to Bitcoin massively affect Bitcoin. Things like the internet are a hundred times as important as Bitcoin. It's literally the foundation something like Bitcoin runs on. The these issues right now are of insane importance. Yeah, I mean, you kept getting uh, cut out there, I guess, uh, you know, we're trying to partition you off the network right now. Yeah, but, you know, like, I, I first had this brought to my attention by Alex Gladstein, and I've been seeing him get a lot of shit for this, a lot of technical people kind of arguing like he's jumping the gun or just being off the cuff, and no, he's not. Like... I actually do have a little bit of a grasp of the actual engineering concern underlying that. And he is absolutely not overblowing this or being reactive. 
Like we, we've seen this play out before with the foundations of technology being set and how that has precedent consequences. People take advantage of that in the moment and we don't realize it for decades. Like he, he is not overreacting at all. Yeah. I mean, when I saw this, I felt kind of like, uh, yeah, this is just more and more of this like evidence that uh, there's some big macro plays going on between the U.S. and China. I hope we can still work together in all of this and keep moving forward as two nations that do get to get along. But I mean, like things are definitely moving in a direction where it's like hard to say that's going to be the case. For our governments, no, you're right, but it doesn't have to be the case for people from those two places. You're right. I've seen, uh, seen what you posted about, um, what's her name, uh, Real Sexy Cyborg, about Naomi. like, uh, yeah, what'd you say, like, uh, you did have disdain for her government, she has disdain for yours, but we can work together in this moment. Yeah, she's not her government, I am not my government. Right on. I am not anyone's government. And yeah, no, and that. no one, and no one is mine. All right. So as crazy as that situation is, I mean, uh, you know, we're gonna see how that plays out, and uh, we're just gonna try and continue this episode and finish it out because there's been some other uh, pretty awesome developments. Another one. So uh, Francis tweeted out Thursday. Uh, Francis Poulier from Bull Bitcoin. They added a new asset uh, called LCAD which is a liquid token of the Canadian dollar, only redeemable for Bitcoin at their exchange bull Bitcoin. It's uh, also redeemable for Canadian dollars at their institutional partner, AquaNow. And uh, now bull Bitcoin users can buy and sell Bitcoin for LBTC and LCAD. Francis says in their statement, quote, the liquid CAD logo is a drop of blood because our objective is to accelerate fiat bleed, a phenomenon best described by Pierre Richard in his magnificent essay, Speculative Attack, close quote. And I think we all understand that. And uh, we've been kind of waiting for a long time to see, uh, bull, you, know, care, you know, players like Bull Bitcoin and uh, Liquid Federators start to uh, try and actually bring in tokenized assets of those regional currencies. And so now they're able to do that. And it Looks like the gloves are off in the banking competition in Montreal. And like I was saying earlier, you know, that we're in a really weird situation and we really have to innovate our way out of this. And uh, part of that is like uh, what, you know, Bull Bitcoin is doing right here. And so, uh, yeah, props to Bull Bitcoin for getting that out and uh, for their new partnership with AquaNow. And I hope that uh, it goes, the development goes well. I'm going to be watching it with great interest. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think Liquid has a huge potential with that kind of fiat bridge getting baked into the, you know, walled garden. It is quite fascinating the way that technology sometimes works and sometimes doesn't work. And uh, yeah, I mean, the uh, CAD seems to not be working. So maybe the LCAD can work for the uh, Canadians over there a little bit better. All right. Well, next up, uh, got some, I guess, next cool little gizmo from fucking CoinKite rapid style. So they now have uh, available a power only uh, USB cable with a magnetic adapter. So it just has like a little mini uh, USB plug that you can leave plugged into the cold card and it just snaps together with the cable head magnetically. And it's designed, you know, this only has wires if you trust them, which I do. Um, to deliver power. There literally isn't a, a data cable uh, capable of moving any digital information back and forth through the device. So next level uh, step up in accessories to really keep that air gap paranoia going. Because if you're not going to do it seriously, you're not going to do it right. Why are you doing it? And now I've just another reason I've got to get a cold card. Man, I want one of these. Ba boom yeah, this is it's just, you know, like I said last time when uh, <clears throat> I was talking about the little uh, adapter for a battery that on that level guarantees um, that it's only feeding power. Like those things are really shady and look just like a normal cable and shit nowadays. So like the, the more tin foil layers you can put between you and your private keys, the, the, the more potential failure points could happen and you still in that wind up keeping your Bitcoin safe. 
All right. So in other news, um, Blockstream Green has rebranded um, a kind of regional variant um, as Blockstream Red for the Chinese market. And the reason they did this is because in China and the financial markets, they generally show red candles as bullish or the prices going up and green for bearish candles. So it's it's kind of always been a culturally clashing thing that in, in the West and a lot of the world, uh, green is seen as like the, the color of gains or good luck, whereas in China, it's the exact opposite. And so they, they kind of reskinned and rebranded this to really go as as much as they could to to get rid of just a, an obvious cultural clash like that that doesn't just come across the way it does in the rest of the world and i think that's kind of a cool thing you know what i mean it's user experience is a big important part of everything and you really should be thinking regionally about like how to optimize that and not just assume the same app is the best form for everybody yeah, that's actually uh, pretty interesting. I didn't realize that their their uh, green candles was the losses and the red candles were the gains. So it makes more sense. And uh, I just thought, yeah, for sure, I know that China likes red. So it does make sense overall now, like uh, on a bigger picture. So, yeah, uh, way to try and, you know, please the users. Mm -hmm. And then next up is actually a really cool thing, especially given the current market conditions um brains os released a uh a new version of their software and firmware that allows a potential up to 30 percent increase in hash rate um a mode that runs at a, a lower power level so a less wattage draw and get a, a much more uh, efficient uh, correlation between the, the power you're drawing and how many hashes you're getting for it. So something to really optimize the electrical costs. And I mean, right now, given how screwed the market is, um, you know, I think it's a very important thing to be able to really optimize the hell out of old hardware like this, because, you know, as we, um, said in the last episode, I think it was when we talked about the uh, digital mining operation um, owned by DPW Holdings, like it seemed like they were mostly running old equipment, like S9s, and they had to shut their entire farm down. So <laughs> like did this, you know, I mean, this could have potentially made a difference there. Heck yeah, all those old S9s need as much optimization as they can right now. That happening's coming up, and I mean, I know there was that 15% drop in difficulty, but it didn't seem to, you know, didn't seem, I, I mean, there. I think, uh, I don't think, yeah, I think the hash rate actually went up, like, a lot of, after that. Let's see. Yeah, you know, I mean, you stretch life for these machines, and you, you keep more hash rate around securing the network. All right, I guess, um... Yeah, last thing up, I think, is uh, you, Janine. I am, yeah, had to, had to check the news desk again because uh, the entire thing was erased from my brain due to rage. Uh-huh. Well, uh, this will maybe restart your rage a little bit. Um, so, unfortunately, the article that is linked in the description is the, is the Wall Street Journal, and, of course, they have a paywall, so I can't actually read <laughs> the, most of it. I can read the first two paragraphs, though, and that gets across the gist of the news event. Um, basically, Washington State adopted a law that was basically written by Microsoft that uh, they claim... Uh, aims to, you know, restrict the use of facial recognition uh, for, you know, lawful purposes and won't uh, ensure it isn't deployed for broad surveillance or tracking innocent people. But of course, we know that is uh, bullshit. And I will move on to another article that explains why. Um, in the Washington Times, which you can actually read, uh, the uh, ACLU in Washington state uh, disagreed that the law would protect uh, civil liberties. Um, they said that the law allows the government to use uh, racially biased facial recognition technology. And the quote from 
Jennifer Lee um, at the ACLU says we will continue to push for a moratorium to give historically targeted and marginalized communities such as black and indigenous communities an opportunity to decide not just how uh, facial surveillance technology should be used, but if it should be used at all. Um, Microsoft apparently is claiming that the legislation protects human rights, including that the technology must not be used on a discriminatory basis towards people of various races, genders, sexual orientations, and other groups, um, which is kind of funny because uh, literally the uh, <laughs> the image at the top of the uh, Wall Street Journal article, I will go back to that and read, and it will show you that that is bullshit. So the, uh, the image, um, the caption below the image in the Wall Street Journal says, facial recognition is going mainstream. The technology is increasingly used by law enforcement agencies and in schools, casinos and retail stores, spurring privacy concerns. Um, and apparently, I guess they have a podcast called Upstream. Um, he basically, the, the facial recognition technology was being tested at, at an elementary school in Seattle and there was a company that was claiming that uh, their algorithm could, quote, identify potential terrorists based on their facial features. Um, yeah. How, how exactly do you do that without discriminating against people based on how they look or their race? I don't, I don't get it. Like, <laughs> if this, if this kind of algorithm if this company is supposedly within the confines of these new regulations to limit facial recognition uh that seems like a contradiction <laughs> seems to me just like trying to go we regulated it so it's okay now also in what universe uh do we assume that a law that was basically written by an employee at Microsoft is going to care about our privacy or civil liberties. Cause last I checked, they don't seem to do that with their principal product, which is windows. Mm -hmm. Oh man. I'm telling you, I'm worried about our country and our rights and everything. And yeah, that area, uh, they've been working with, these companies for a while like you know silicon valley and washington state seattle area like i wouldn't be surprised if uh yeah they try to you know implement some of this stuff there first meanwhile their uh neighbor to the south california um i think no i think it was actually just i don't think it was a statewide thing but san francisco banned uh facial recognition technology in the last couple of years Everybody okay. does something right, eventually. Yeah, let's see if it holds. All right, though, you guys want to take us into final thoughts? My final thought is wear a face mask and uh, protect your privacy and your, uh, your fellow neighbors and yourself as much as possible for preventing the spread. You know, it's one of those things that uh, I guess, like, you know, yeah, it's just... I don't know who's not wearing a face mask at this point. Come on, it's trendy. Get with the trends. Jeannie, you got anything for us today? Yeah, so I don't remember if I gave an update on the uh, fundraiser that was going on for Chelsea Manning. Um, I think I did mention it, but I don't remember if I updated on the conclusion. Uh, basically, within, I think it was like... 48 to 72 hours of um, it being um, announced that Chelsea was going to be released from jail because the grand jury had been closed. Um, she obviously still had the outstanding fines that were being imposed on her as punishment for refusing to participate in the grand jury in addition to being in jail. Um, it amounted to, I, th I don't think it got quite to 250,000. Um, it might've gotten that high. I can't remember, but it was somewhere around 250,000. And so within 48 to 72 hours of that being the case that she was going to be released, um, people not only raised 250,000 to pay off the court fines, but they also raised another 58,000, which was, I think 20,000 
more than the goal, actually. Um, they raised another 58000 to cover rent and other living expenses once she leaves the hospital because, unfortunately, she um, reportedly tried to commit suicide right before a hearing that was supposed to make a decision about whether um, whether she would continue to be confined. So um, there hasn't we haven't really heard from her at all since then. Um, probably either because she's in the hospital or still recovering um, outside of the hospital. But there was a support account for Chelsea Manning that uh, gave an update. Um, I think they were the ones running the GoFundMe. And they said, hey, folks, Chelsea's fine and just taking a badly needed break. Some of you have expressed concerns, so we wanted to make sure that she, you knew she was okay. Thanks again for everything, and you can still donate to her living expenses fund here. Um, that's at, I think it's GoFundMe, help fund Chelsea's living expenses. Um, that's the title of the fundraiser. Um, but it's raised more than enough Um already so that's really great because it means not only does she not have to worry about paying off court fines while she's recovering and finally leaving jail behind but she won't have to worry about um getting a job or doing fundraising herself in order to live yeah that's a good thing i saw that uh, that fundraiser went up uh, pretty high, pretty quick, and it's good to hear that uh, you know she's going to be getting some support with those funds. Mm -hmm. It's a much more effective way, in my opinion, of protesting things than just digging a deeper hole for yourself. There is also a uh, new chapter out for Fisheye Placebo, which is my favorite cyberpunk comic. Um, and I was looking at it particularly in the last couple of weeks because one of the characters and it's the the story is about um, I mean it's it's heavily based off of uh, China and Chinese culture because the artist herself is Chinese. Um, but one of the characters has some really awesome PPE gear that she wears when she goes out spray painting uh, propaganda around town so definitely check that out if you want to get into an art project and make uh make surviving this virus more fun mm -hmm. and i guess my last thought is stop using fucking zoom people like it is so obviously a ccp intelligence operation and using it, you are literally just helping give them one of the biggest treasure troves of intelligence on every level of society for the rest of the world that they have ever had the opportunity to gather. Stop. On that note, punks, everybody stay frosty and be safe, and we'll catch you next week. Later, everyone. Theta in. Hello,